Hi, and thanks for watching this message video, and Merry Christmas from all of us here at Followers Church. Today and over the next couple of weeks, what we're going to be doing is looking at different Christmas songs or songs and celebrating their lyrics or their meaning. And the song that we're going to be looking at today is O Come Emmanuel, which we all now recognize as a cry out to Jesus, our Messiah, for help. However, when you look at the lyrics of the song, there is a much deeper story going on. Now, over the years, there have been a lot of different verses or multiple verses to this song. However, it's the first verse in the tune that are most popular, and they have stayed relatively the same. Here's what the first verse says. O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel, who mourns in lonely exile here, until the Son of God appear. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel, shall come to thee, O Israel. For those who don't know, the lyrics to this song are a reference to the nation of Israel that spent about 70 years in captivity or in exile. And during that time, they were awaiting the Messiah to come, the Son of God, to come and rescue them and return them to their land. What's also deeper into the story is this, is that in 930 BC approximately, the nation of Israel became divided into two kingdoms. The kingdom of Israel was in the north with Samaria as its capital, and the kingdom of Judah was in the south with Jerusalem as its capital. Now, both kingdoms were rebellious, both kingdoms were bad, but it was the kingdom of Israel and its king that was exceptionally bad. And as a direct result, God was preparing to punish them both and send them both into exile. However, before any of that happened, God sent his prophet Isaiah into the story to confront the king of Judah and said some things to him or proclaimed some, uh, some things to him that are very relevant to our story or to our topic today. Here's what Isaiah said. Isaiah 7, 1 through 9. When Ahaz, son of Jotham, and grandson of Uzziah, was king of Judah, King Retzin of Syria, and Pekah, son of Ramalia, the king of Israel, set out to attack Jerusalem. However, they were unable to carry out their plan. The news had come to the royal court of Judah. Syria is allied with Israel against us. So the hearts of the king and his people trembled with fear, like trees shaking in a storm. Then the Lord said to Isaiah, Take your son, Shear Yashub, and go out to meet King Ahaz. You will find him at the end of the aqueduct that feeds water into the upper pool near the road leading to the field where cloth is washed. Tell him to stop worrying. Tell him he doesn't need to fear the fierce anger of those two burned out embers, King Retzin of Syria and Pekah, son of Ramalia. Yes, the kings of Syria and Israel are plotting against him, saying, We will attack Judah and capture it for ourselves. Then we will install the son of Tabeel as Judah's king. But this is what the sovereign Lord says. This invasion will never happen. It will never take place. For Syria is no stronger than its capital, Damascus. And Damascus is no stronger than its king, Retzin. As for Israel, Within 65 years, it will be crushed and completely destroyed. Israel is no stronger than its capital, Samaria, and Samaria is no stronger than its king, Pekah, son of Ramalia. Unless your faith is firm, I cannot make you stand firm. Before we go any further, I want to point out three things that should stand out. Here's the first thing. Fear and worry annoy God. The first thing that God wanted Isaiah to tell King Ahaz was to stop worrying, was to stop acting in fear. The reason why is these things annoy God. Did you know that throughout the entirety of the Bible that there are over 250 direct commands to not be afraid or to not show fear? Or that there are nearly as many direct commands to be strong or to be courageous or to show faith? In other words, our faith, when it's on display, makes God giddy, it makes him happy, and it motivates him to want to use us or to reveal his plans to us or to share with us his desires. We need to remember that. Here's the next thing that should stand out. Number two, God knows the future. God not only wanted Ahaz to know that he had the present covered, he also wanted him to know that he had the future covered. In fact, he used Isaiah to tell him that 65 years from this point in time, that Israel was going to be destroyed, that it was going to be going into exile. So in other words, God wants us to remember that he doesn't just have the present covered, that he has the future covered as well. And he wanted Ahaz to know this so that it would increase or so that it would build faith inside of him. And God wants the same thing from us. Here's the next thing that should stand out. Number three, the faith equation gets explained. 
God used Isaiah to explain the faith equation better than anybody, I think. For instance, what God told Ahaz through the prophet Isaiah was that he could not make him stand firm unless his faith in him was firm. In other words, God's part of the equation and Ahaz's part of the equation or our part of the equation are different. Ahaz's or our part of the equation is to bring faith. It's to have faith. God's part of the equation is to tell us what it is that he's going to do, which is what he did with Ahaz. He used the prophet Isaiah to tell him what it was that he was going to do. And then what Ahaz needed to do was then to either believe it or not believe it and then act on it in faith. That is the same thing that God asks us to do. He tells us what it is that he's going to do through his word. And those who have read through the Bible know this. But then what he asks us to do is then believe it and in faith act on it, trusting that what it is that he said that he's going to do, that he will do. That's the faith equation explained. And that's what God wants from those of us, that we would remember to not act in fear and be annoying, that we would remember that he knows the future and he has it covered as well as the present. And so therefore you and I can trust him and act in faith rather than in fear. Now, Let's continue on with what Isaiah said to Ahaz about what he was uh, specifically supposed to do and what God was specifically going to do. Isaiah 7, 10 through 16. Later the Lord sent this message to King Ahaz. Ask the Lord your God for a sign of confirmation, Ahaz. Make it as difficult as you want and as high as heaven or as deep as the place of the dead. But the king refused. No, he said. I will not test the Lord like that. Then Isaiah said, Listen well, you royal family of David. Isn't it enough to exhaust human patience? Must you exhaust the patience of my God as well? All right, then. The Lord himself will give you the sign. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. By the time this child is old enough to choose what is right and reject what is wrong, he will be eating yogurt and honey. For before the child is that old, the lands of the two kings you fear so much will both be deserted. Ahaz wanted a sign of confirmation from God because he didn't believe that he actually could spare or save or preserve the line of Judah, the tribe of Judah, which the Messiah was prophesied to come from. So as a result, God sent Isaiah to confront Ahaz about his lack of faith, which is when Ahaz annoyingly denied that he would ever ask for such a thing and got scolded by Isaiah for being annoying. And then he told him, okay, fine, God will give you the sign which was in the future, a remnant of Israel would still exist and that a virgin would be the one who would give birth to the Messiah, Emmanuel, God with us. But believe it or not, this wasn't the first time that God had given Ahaz a sign that a remnant in the future would still exist. It was the second. Now, let me go back to something that I had read earlier. Isaiah 7, 3 through 4. Then the Lord said to Isaiah, Take your son, Shearishub, and go out to meet King Ahaz. You will find him at the end of the aqueduct that feeds water into the upper pool, near the road leading to the field where cloth is washed. Tell him to stop worrying. Tell him he doesn't need to fear the fierce anger of those two burned-out embers, King Retzin of Syria and Pekah, son of Ramalia. To you and I, the name Shearishub is just another weird or odd Hebrew name, but that's not the case to any Israelite at all. Names always had meaning, and certainly in this particular situation, this name had meaning. So in my mind, the way that this story plays out is Isaiah and his son roll up to this aqueduct and the surprised King Ahaz says, Isaiah, what are you doing here? And who's this kid with you? To which Isaiah responds, oh, this is my son, Shear Yashub. To which everybody then understood the meaning being a remnant will return. This was God's way of showing off. And not just showing off, this was God's way of showing us, Gentiles, that he has always had a plan from the beginning in order to incorporate those of us who aren't necessarily Jews or Hebrews or Israelites into his family or into this remnant. For instance, many of you may know that the Apostle Paul was specifically called by God or by Jesus, his son, to be a witness to the Gentiles. And that prior to this, he was maybe one of the most religious or devout Jews, being a Pharisee. What this means is that Paul not only understood or grasped the significance of God's promise to the nation of Israel and that he would rescue them and return them to their land out of exile, 
But he also understood the significance of belonging that was being offered to the Gentiles by this same Messiah that would rescue Israel and bring them into Israel. In fact, listen to what the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Rome, but specifically to the Jews who were attending the church in Rome. Romans 2, 17 through 29. You who call yourselves Jews are relying on God's law and you boast about your special relationship with him. You know what he wants. You know what is right because you have been taught his law. You are convinced that you are a guide for the blind and a light for people who are lost in darkness. You think you can instruct the ignorant and teach children the ways of God. For you are certain that God's law gives you complete knowledge and truth. Well then, if you teach others, why don't you teach yourself? You tell others not to steal, but do you steal? You say it is wrong to commit adultery, but do you commit adultery? You condemn idolatry, but do you use items stolen from pagan temples? You are so proud of knowing the law, but you dishonor God by breaking it. No wonder the scriptures say the Gentiles blaspheme the name of God because of you. The Jewish ceremony of circumcision has value only if you obey God's law. But if you don't obey God's law, you are no better off than an uncircumcised Gentile. And if the Gentiles obey God's law, won't God declare them to be his own people? In fact, uncircumcised Gentiles who keep God's law will condemn you Jews who are circumcised and possess God's law but don't obey it. For you are not a true Jew just because you were born of Jewish parents or because you have gone through the ceremony of circumcision. No, a true Jew is one whose heart is right with God. And true circumcision is not merely obeying the letter of the law. Rather, it is a change of heart produced by the Spirit. And a person with a changed heart seeks praise from God, not from people. Paul was trying to correct the sanctimonious attitude that the Jews had toward God, and toward Jesus, and really toward Gentiles. All things that Paul himself had struggled with at one point in time. And now he was trying to tell them how wrong he was and how wrong they were. The truth is, no Jewish ceremony or no Jewish tradition, regardless of how important it may be to somebody, matters to God unless there is faith in his Messiah. So therefore, no Jew, regardless of how devout they may be, will ever experience God's forgiveness or his presence unless they place their faith and trust in Jesus Christ as Messiah and then demonstrate that faith and trust in him. And whenever anybody does, regardless of who they are, when they place their faith and trust in the Messiah, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, God's Son, we are then given the Spirit of God or the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, to fill us, which means God is with us, Emmanuel with us. And that is what makes a person a true Jew. That is what makes a person a true follower. That is what includes a person in God's remnant or Israel. And this is what the Apostle Paul wanted the church to know. In fact, when he continued to write to the people in the church of Rome, he continued to explain this great, big, huge story to them that God has wanted from the very beginning to include the Gentiles. In fact, listen to how he went on to explain to both Jews and Gentiles about this great plan. Romans 11. I ask then, has God rejected his own people, the nation of Israel? Of course not. I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham and a member of the tribe of Benjamin. No, God has not rejected his own people, whom he chose from the very beginning. Do you realize what the scriptures say about this? Elijah, the prophet, explained to God about the people of Israel and said, Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. And do you remember God's reply? He said, no. I have 7,000 others who have never bowed down to Baal. It is the same today. For a few of the people of Israel have remained faithful because of God's grace, his undeserved kindness in choosing them. And since it is through God's kindness, then it is not by their good works. For in that case, God's grace would not be what it really is, free and undeserved. So this is the situation. Most of the people of Israel have not found the favor of God they are looking for so earnestly. A few have the ones God has chosen, but the hearts of the rest were hardened. I am saying all of this especially for you Gentiles. God has appointed me as the apostle to the Gentiles. I stress this for I want somehow to make the people of Israel jealous of what you Gentiles have, so I might save some of them. For since their rejection meant that God offered salvation to the rest of the world, their acceptance will be even more wonderful. It will be life for those who were dead. And since Abraham and the other patriarchs were holy, their descendants will also be holy. Just as the entire batch of dough is holy because the portion given as an offering is holy. For if the roots of the tree are holy, the branches will be too. But some of these branches from Abraham's tree, some of the people of Israel, have been broken off. And you Gentiles, who were branches from a wild olive tree, have been grafted in. So now you also receive the blessing God has promised Abraham and his children, sharing in the rich nourishment from the root of God's special olive tree. 
But you must not brag about being grafted in to replace the branches that were broken off. You are just a branch, not the root. Well, you may say, those branches were broken off to make room for me. Yes. But remember, those branches were broken off because they didn't believe in Christ. And you are there because you do believe. So don't think highly of yourself, but fear what could happen. For if God did not spare the original branches, he won't spare you either. Paul was trying to help the Jews to understand that the cry, O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel, had been heard. That God had already responded by sending Jesus Christ, his son, the Messiah, Emmanuel, God with us. And he wanted Jews and Gentiles all to know that the, the definition of what a true Jew is or an Israelite had changed. That no longer was it something that was specified simply by sim simple circumcision, but it was a change of the heart produced by the Holy Spirit. Which means that anyone, anyone can cry out to Jesus the Messiah to have help and it will be heard. Which means that those of us who have faith, those of us who do believe in Jesus Christ and display our faith in him are now true Jews. We are true Israelites. We are the ones who now have all of the promises that were given to Abraham. And this is something the Apostle Paul was not only specifically called to do, but he said this multiple times. And what is what I want to finish with today? Galatians 3, 28 through 29. There is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus, and now that you belong to Christ, you are the true children of Abraham. You are his heirs, and God's promise to Abraham belongs to you.